Graduating from college is a time when many young adults embrace their independence as they begin a new chapter. With the world at their fingertips, many are eager to explore and adventure before settling into adult life and all of the responsibilities that really come along with it. But what many students haven't learned in school is that the world, the real world, can also be a very scary place. What should be a time of freedom and growth can quickly become a nightmare when the wrong people can take advantage of that innocence, that young ignorance and naive approach to life. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened in today's case. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life. Let's jump in. Twenty-one-year-old Grace Emmy Rose Mullane was born in Essex, England, on December 2, 1996. She was born to parents David and Jillian, and Grace was the youngest of three siblings. She shared a very close relationship with her parents and her two older brothers, who were named Michael and Declan. The Mullane family was a very down-to-earth and genuine family, and Gracie, as her father just affectionately called her, was no different. Friends and family described her as caring, compassionate, bright, and, of course, fun-loving. The family had lived in the same home from the time that Grace was just nine years old. And there, they shared beloved family pets, spirited holidays, summer parties, and even European vacations. Grace's father, David, who was one of ten siblings, described them as a very large and very close family. Grace attended St. Joseph's Catholic Primary School in Stanford Lay Hope before attending Brentwood Ursuline Covenant High School and then finishing her last two years at St. Thomas More High School. Grace was very popular among her peers, and she was popular because of her outgoing personality and really her ability to just draw people in. Her school chaplain, Claire Bailey, had even said she was always bright and full of energy, and her smile would just shine. Grace was a very talented field hockey player and also a skilled artist. She shared her paintings and her sketches on social media platforms, and one of her pieces was even featured in London's mall galleries. After high school, Grace attended the University of Lincoln in Lincoln, England, and when she began college, she was in a long-term relationship with a high school boyfriend. But the pair parted ways after the first year, and Grace was soon posting on social media about the adventures of this young, single college student. As an independent and confident single woman, Grace did discuss her sex life with her friends. And those friends recounted her telling them that she particularly enjoyed BDSM and rough sex, including choking. She apparently had many different social media accounts and several fetish communities where she made it clear that she was open to experimentation. A former sexual partner admitted practicing BDSM with Grace, but stressed that they had a safe word and they were always very careful about the physical and psychological effects. He acknowledged, too, that she had this very naive type of persona about her and worried that by being so open, it could make her vulnerable to predatory people. Now, aside from her personal interests, Grace worked very hard in college, temping in her father's office and also continuing to focus on her artwork, which she really had a natural talent for. But one passion that she hadn't fully explored yet was her desire to travel. Even with a loving family and many friends and also a promising talent, Grace still was yearning to experience life outside of her hometown. Her brother Michael had said that she really did have a passion to see the world. So when Grace graduated from the University of Lincoln with a degree in marketing and advertising in 2018, she was really excited to finally take a backpacking trip that she had been saving up her money so long for. She couldn't wait to embark on this new adventure, but she remained the caring and compassionate Grace that she always had been, even taking time to cut and donate her hair to the Little Princess Trust so that it could be used for wigs for children with cancer. Just an absolute lovely person. She also ended a year-long relationship before she left for that trip, but by all accounts, the breakup was amicable, and the two of them just had agreed that long distance wouldn't work. So now she was embarking on this whole new chapter of her life, world travel, being independent again, being a single girl, having some of the college experience under her belt, and really just seeing the world. 
So in October of 2018, Grace left for the trip of a lifetime. Peru was her first of many stops, and she eagerly shared photos on social media, and also with her family, who she spoke with often during her travels. Her family said that she actually bombarded them with all of her cheerful updates. The family had always kept in very close contact, and that continued as usual. After Peru, Grace then traveled to South America for six weeks, and then finally made her way to New Zealand in mid-November finally arriving in Auckland a couple of weeks later. Friends said that Grace had been the most excited to see New Zealand in all of her travels. And after New Zealand, Grace had planned to head to Fiji and Australia before ultimately returning home in June. Just like a lengthy world travel trip. The trip of a lifetime, right? So on November 30th, 2018, Grace checked into a hostel called Base Backpackers with other travelers who were also in Auckland. That night, she matched with a man on Tinder, and the next day, on December 1st, Grace made plans to meet with him. It was the day before her 22nd birthday, and although Grace didn't have plans, she didn't seem initially very interested in his advances. However, eventually, he persuaded her to meet him at Sky City. So at around 5.30 p.m. on December 1st, Grace left the hostel, and she headed to Sky City. Dressed in a little black dress with white sneakers and a small purse, she was ready to have a very good night out on the town. Grace took a picture of the Christmas tree in the courtyard and sent it to her parents, just again documenting her travels and having so much fun doing so. The following day, on December 2nd, it was Grace's birthday. Family and friends who had been inundated with updates about Grace's travels began reaching out and sending their well wishes, their birthday wishes. But the problem was, there was no response. And this was unusual for Grace, and her phones were going straight to voicemail. So Grace's family was immediately alarmed, because for her, this was very out of character. A couple of days passed, and on December 5th, Grace's parents ended up contacting the Auckland police, and they reported her as missing. Initially, the police, though, weren't very concerned about a young woman not returning after a night of drinking. They figured that she might have stayed with some new friends that she made, maybe her phone had died, maybe she was sleeping off a hangover, who knows. But when they contacted the hostel that she was staying in, they had told them that she had never even checked back in and that her belongings were still there. As missing posters were beginning to start getting shared, detectives started combing through CCTV footage from the local area to see if they were able to find her and they were able to quickly identify Grace's mystery date. CCTV footage showed Grace meeting her date by that Christmas tree, that same one that she had taken a photo of and sent to her family. He approached her confidently, but hugged her somewhat awkwardly, and then the two of them walked away together. The pair headed toward Andy's Burger Bar, and that footage didn't just capture their first meeting. Quite a bit of their night together was caught on video as they moved between bars and were getting drinks. The couple looked affectionate. They were embracing each other and even kissing. At 9.40 p.m. on the eve of Grace's 22nd birthday, that CCTV footage shows her returning to her date's apartment. They looked like any other comfortable young couple returning from a fun night out as they started walking toward the building with their arms wrapped around each other and holding hands. So they saw all the CCTV footage that we've shown throughout this video. They were even able to see something suspicious happen while Grace was hanging out on that date. At around 9.20, Grace had gotten up to go and use the restroom during the date. And that footage captured Grace's date rifling through her purse while she was gone, which was extremely weird. Police also talked with Grace's friend Amina Ashcroft. Text messages that Grace had sent Amina throughout the date confirmed that she did like her date. Amina said that they communicated throughout the night and she could tell by the text that Grace was pretty drunk. Amina saw some red flags in how Grace was describing her date, but she said that Grace really seemed to like the guy, telling her, literally, I click with him so well. The last message that Grace sent Amina that night said, I'll let you know what happens tomorrow. Police looked at Grace's social media, and they noticed that shortly after Grace had returned from the bathroom, her date posted a comment on her Facebook profile picture, and the comment read, beautiful, very radiant. It's just creepy and kind of strange, and I think honestly to me it really speaks to his character that he left a complimentary comment on her page mere minutes after he was invading her privacy by searching through her purse, also while she was in the bathroom. However, thanks to that comment, detectives quickly put a name to the face that they were seeing on that CCTV footage. 
and they identified the man as 26-year-old Jesse Shane Kepson. Jesse Kempson was born in Lower Hutt on December 28, 1991, and he grew up in Wellington. Jesse's parents separated when he was nine, and after the split, he was raised mainly by his dad and his grandfather. It's been said that Jesse had a volatile upbringing, with even some trauma involved, very much the opposite of Grace's somewhat perfect family life growing up. Whether he was affected by his upbringing or born the way he was, family and friends do not describe him in a flattering way. Like, not at all. Nearly everyone who came into contact with him called him a compulsive liar. His own stepbrother said that he was a pathological liar who enjoyed having power over people. And these weren't harmless, just little lies either. Jesse had gone so far as to tell people that he was dying of cancer and that he had gang relations. Okay, the landlord at his City Life apartment, which is a full-service apartment, kind of like a hotel, initially believed that Jesse was a top manager for a company called Woolworth, who made six figures a year. That wouldn't have been unusual for that upscale apartment building, because plenty of people and business people called this building home. But apparently, he began to get suspicious when he saw Jesse wandering the halls at all hours. After his rent was late on multiple occasions, his landlord learned that state benefits were actually what paid his rent, not this six-figure salary that Jesse had told him. And this was despite Jesse telling people that he was everything from a successful businessman to a professional softball player. And his last job was in telephone sales. Not only that, but he had been fired from that sales job the exact day that he met Grace, and he was fired for lying. Immediately after identifying him on the CCTV and social media, police knew that they wanted to talk with Jesse, so they showed up to speak with him. Jesse arrived back at the apartment, but when he saw the police, he turned around and tried to hide his face as he then hurried away. The officer spotted Jesse and chased him as an employee was looking on and watching the whole thing happen. They caught up to him that day and then brought him in for questioning. Jesse ran through the events of the night with them, and he started by stating that they met at Sky City because he didn't initially know that she was real, because apparently there's a lot of catfishing that goes on on Tinder. He claimed that at the end of the night, there was a hug and a kiss on the cheek before they went their separate ways with a plan to keep in touch. However, investigators didn't believe him, and the reason for that was because cameras had captured the pair getting off the elevator and then heading toward one of the apartments. They also searched his studio apartment, that last place that Grace was seen walking toward. As they looked into him more, what they found was very concerning. Jesse was estranged from his family and also had claimed that he was recently diagnosed with anxiety. And a couple of weeks before he met Grace, Jesse posted a very strange message on his Facebook account. It was seemingly apologetic to all of the people that he had wronged, but in my opinion, it still kind of had a self-serving vibe that kind of gave me the ick. One part said, My clear arrogance and selfishness has truly affected the relationship I have with people in my personal life. He went on to say that he was sorry from the bottom of his heart, but claimed that he had changed and that he had compassion for others. Jesse didn't only send out red flags with his family and with business relationships, but also romantic relationships as well. Women described Jesse as overbearing and controlling, even when he barely knew them. He was a serial dater who presented himself as well-dressed and clean, but then quickly became unhinged, badgering women to describe their sexual experiences and then prodding for personal information. Multiple women started accusing him of just being a creep in general. And it turned out to go so much further than creepy comments, but we're going to have more on that later. For now, let's focus on Jesse's mindset leading up to his Tinder date with Grace. He had been laid on rent and fired from his job, and he was likely spiraling as his lies once again were catching up with him. So what was Jesse doing as Grace's family and friends were frantically texting her on what was supposed to be a celebratory day, her birthday? Well, once again, luckily, there was plenty of CCTV footage to show us his movements that day as well. Detectives had almost six terabytes of CCTV data to analyze in this case, which is just a massive amount of footage. Cameras in the building he was staying at captured Jesse getting in the elevator at 8 a.m. on December 2nd, Grace's birthday. 
He was alone, and he eventually left the lobby and headed toward the atrium on Elliot, arriving there about seven minutes later. Detectives watched footage of Jesse browsing and then purchasing a suitcase. After that, he went on to buy cleaning supplies. Around 11 a.m., he took a taxi to a car rental company where he rented a red Toyota Corolla. Shockingly, several hours after Jesse was seen on camera renting a car and buying a suitcase and buying cleaning supplies, he went on a Tinder date. So when police went and talked to the woman who he went on a date with, she told the police that he made her feel extremely uncomfortable. And when she went on to share some of his statements, uncomfortable might be an understatement. On the date, Jesse had talked about shopping for a large duffel bag for sports equipment and even broached the topic of murder. She said how he told her how crazy it was that a guy could make one wrong move and go to jail for the rest of his life. He went on to describe a guy that he knew who had asked his girlfriend to have rough sex with him involving strangulation or suffocation. He told her that it had gone wrong and that he tried to revive her, but that she died. And this friend ended up getting charged with manslaughter. And as if all that wasn't disturbing enough for a first date, he took it even further, telling her that police dogs can only smell bodies that are buried more than four feet under adding that police were having problems because lots of bodies were going missing in the Y Talkery ranges. Now, obviously, by that point, the woman just wanted to escape this date from hell, and she left the date and then also declined a ride home from Jesse. Unfazed, this man then went on with his day, collecting cleaning supplies and even renting a rug doctor cleaning machine, telling employees that it was for red wine stains. Footage captured him taking that rug doctor up to the room a little before 9 p.m. on December 2nd. At 9.30, Jesse pushed a trolley loaded with two seemingly heavy suitcases into the elevator, and then he packed them into the trunk of his rental car. He looks unfazed, and even appears to joke around with an employee as he returns the empty trolley back to the lobby. Bright and early on the morning of December 3rd, Jesse then headed out on yet another suspicious shopping trip, this time buying a shovel around 7 a.m. Again, he chatted up the cashier and appeared to be running casual errands. Jesse then dropped off bags at a dry cleaner before heading to a car wash. There, he was caught on camera yet again, power washing the car before he returned it to the rental company, where it was then rented by someone else. Now, let me just say this. Maybe I'm not a good Samaritan. I don't know. But anytime I've rented a car, I have never washed it or detailed it before returning it. So to power wash a rental before returning it kind of throws up a red flag in my book. Again, maybe that is normal and tell me in the comments. Maybe I'm just a bad Samaritan and maybe it's something I need to do going forward. But that thought never would even cross my mind. It never has. And strangely, he left the shovel that he had just purchased that morning leaning against the car wash wall, kind of like leaving things behind and trying not to get caught up with evidence. I don't know, my opinion. So on December 5th, the same day that Grace was reported as missing, Jesse was seen carrying bags, which he then dumped in various trash bins throughout the entire city. Later that day, Grace's father, David, flew to Auckland to help with the search. And on December 7th, he pleaded with the public to help them find his beloved daughter. Understandably, he looked grief-stricken and absolutely heartbroken as he talked about his little girl, stopping at times to regain his composure. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Malign, Christ's dad. Thank you, for, thank you for coming today. As you know, Grace has been missing for several days. We last had contact with her on Saturday the 1st of December. And as a family, we've been extremely concerned for her welfare. Grace is a lovely, outgoing, fun-loving, family-orientated daughter. Grace has never been out of contact for this amount of time. She's usually in daily contact with either her mother, myself, her two brothers, members of the family on social media. I don't know if you know, but Grace is on a year-long worldwide overseas experience. 
Grace started this travel journey in Peru in South America and at the end of this was really looking forward to the second leg in New Zealand. She arrived here on the 20th of November and has been bombarding us with numerous photographs and messages of her adventures. We are all extremely upset and it is very difficult at this time to fully describe the range of emotions we are going through. While we are very grateful for the media coverage both here and back home, we are finding this situation quite upsetting and would sincerely hope that, these, that the media continue to respect our privacy. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to anybody who has seen, spoken to or come into contact with Grace over the last few days and to come forward with any detail, no matter how, many, how small, and contact the investigation team. Once again, I thank you all for coming. As her poor dad was struggling to hold on to hope, the police labeled Jesse as a person of interest, and they said that they had grave concerns for her safety. When detectives spoke to Jesse the first time, he insisted that he and Grace had said goodbye on the street around 10 p.m. and that he hadn't seen her or heard from her since. He even went so far as to say she blocked him on Tinder. On December 8th, detectives interviewed Jesse once again. And by this time, Jesse's story had changed drastically. This time, he claimed that when they returned to his room, they were both very drunk and started making out, saying we were kissing and talking and kissing some more. He then claimed that Grace turned the music down and started talking about Fifty Shades of Grey and bondage. He said the two of them started to have sex and that it was normal, but then he told police, she told me that there's a few things that she likes doing and that she had done with her ex-partner. He told police that Grace started biting him and asking him to bite her, so he complied. He insisted that he asked her if she was sure, and Grace at that point had consented. So at that point, the sex was becoming more violent. He told police that Grace was holding his arms above his head and just biting, and then she spanked his butt, and then went on to say that Grace held him around the neck and pushed down, kind of choking him in a way. And then she allegedly told him to hold her throat and to go harder. Jesse said that the two of them ended up on the floor by the time it was finished, and he got up to go and take a shower. He said he accidentally fell asleep in the shower, and he remembered waking up and crawling back into bed, but it was dark and he didn't see Grace, so he assumed that she had left. Jesse told them that when he woke up the next morning, she was lying on the floor with blood coming out of her nose, and because of that, he panicked. But Jesse insisted that it was an accident. It was violent sex. It was violent sex play that had gone wrong, and it was not murder. Now, you might have noticed that Jesse's face is blurred out in some of the interrogation videos, and there is a reason for that. In New Zealand, they use name suppression to ensure that defendants get a fair trial. Name suppression means that your name or other identifying details cannot be published. Many have complained that this evil man's identity remained protected for so long while Grace's face was splashed over every headline, complete with references in those headlines to BDSM, in an attempt to almost shame her and make this extremely salacious. Some commenters online even noticed that stories about Grace's sexual preferences were published. The media started using pictures that made her look more like a bad girl, with red lipstick giving more of a sultry look. And obviously, this is completely unfair. What this young, single woman preferred sexually behind closed doors has absolutely nothing to do with her character, and she was entitled to experiment with partners under the assumption that they wouldn't harm her in the process. It's a story we see all too often with victim blaming, and it must have made the already unbearable pressure on Grace's family even more crushing. At the end of the interview, the detective told Jesse that he was under the arrest for the murder of Grace. Police conducted a forensic search in Jesse's room, and they found Grace's blood saturating the entire room. Now that blood told a very different story than she simply had a nosebleed. But Jesse cooperated and agreed to take detectives to where he buried Grace. Sickeningly, that spot was the same place he had told his Tinder date while Grace's lifeless body lay dead in his room. 
that same place he had said this horrible thing unfolded to his friend, the Y Talkery Ranges. Detectives Evan Ingley found Grace's body shortly after 4 p.m. on December 9th, and it was off Scenic Drive in the Y Talkery Ranges, about 12 miles west of central Auckland. Detective Inspector Scott Beard spoke with the media at the site, telling them that he believed it was the body of British backpacker Grace Mullane. We located a body which we believe to be Grace. The formal identification process will now take place. However, based on the evidence we have gathered over the past few days, we expect that this is Grace. Obviously, this brings in the search for Grace to an end. It is an unbearable time for the Mullane family, and our hearts go out to them. While he spoke, he admitted that this case had been hard on him, as he had a daughter around the same age. He called it an unbearable time for their family and said that their hearts go out to them. It wasn't just Grace's family that shared that grief, though. Around the nation, thousands of people held vigils in remembrance of the vibrant young backpacker who had only just started her adult life. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern got choked up as she publicly apologized to Grace's family and offered assistance. Look, today I would like to start um, with a comment uh, on the murder of uh, Grace Milan having received a number of media queries about this tragedy. Uh, firstly, I cannot imagine the grief of her family and what they will be experiencing and feeling right now. And my Thoughts and prayers are with her father, David, um, who is in the country, um, her mother, Gillian, who cannot be here, uh, and her wider family, friends uh, and loved ones. You know, from uh, the Kiwis I have spoken to, there is this overwhelming sense of hurt and shame that this has happened in our country, a place that prides itself on our hospitality, on our manaakitanga, um, especially to those who are visiting our shores. And so, on behalf of New Zealand, I want to apologise to Grace's family. Your daughter should have been safe here, and she wasn't, and I'm sorry for that. I've advised the family through the police that if there is anything we can do to assist, we are here to help with that. On December 10th, just nine days after Grace went missing, Jesse appeared in court with his identity suppressed. The autopsy details in the courtroom were horrifying, and Jesse's actions made him look even more like a monster. Results confirmed that Grace had been strangled, and she had bruises on her arms and her chest as if she had been pinned down. The pathologist said that the pressure would have been applied to her neck for at least four to five minutes with considerable force. Now, remember how Jesse told the cops that he had fallen asleep in the shower and believed that Grace had left? Well, his phone searches told an entirely different story about his actions that night. After killing Grace, Jesse had searched for the hottest fire, flesh-eating birds, and why talkery ranges, the exact location where Grace's body was found stuffed into a suitcase. Now, unsatisfied by those morbid searches, he then did the unthinkable. He actually took intimate photos of Grace's dead body and trolled porn sites. It is absolutely disgusting to think about someone having such a little regard for human life. And if there's anything positive to take away from it, it's that those actions likely helped convince the jury that this death was not consensual rough sex gone wrong, as his defense attorney Ian Brookie had argued when his trial first began in November of 2019. Instead, as the prosecutor so aptly stated, it was deliberate, intentional, calm, and callous. He added that Jesse likely held his hand on Grace's neck for five to ten minutes and that she would have lost consciousness, but he still carried on. On November 22, 2019, a jury of five men and seven women found Jesse guilty of the murder of Grace only after five hours of deliberation. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole of 17 years. His own family labeled him as a pathetic fantasist, and the lead investigator said that he was sure that Jesse would have killed someone else if it were not Grace that night. Although such an evil human was locked away for life, it did little to comfort Grace's devastated family. Her parents spoke after the verdict, and honestly, it's hard to watch how broken they were.
Her dad said, this will be with us for the rest of our lives. Uh, you'll have to forgive me because I'm not very good at this. Uh, the verdict of murder today will be welcomed by every member of the Belaine family and friends of grace. It will not reduce the pain, the suffering that we've had to endure for over the past year. I can't see it. Grace was taken away from us in the most brutal fashion a year ago and our lives have been and family have been ripped apart. This will be with us for the rest of our lives. Grace was a beautiful, talented, loving daughter. Grace was our sunshine and she will be missed forever. She did not de deserve to be murdered in such a barbaric way on her OE year. We would like to thank several people. Auckland Police Force been professional, diligent and thorough all through this investigation. A special thank you to Detective Inspector Scott Beard, Detective Senior Sergeant Greg Brand and Detective Tony Jordan. We would like to thank the Crown Prosecution Team, Brian, Robin and Lita. They never flinched away from the more intimate details of the case and were compassionate and thoughtful where the family matters arose. The press contingent, you lot, who have attended court every day with my wife and I and reported truthfully, respectfully, all the events as they unfolded. Last but not least, we would love to thank the people of New Zealand They've opened their hearts to Grace and her family. I cannot express our gratitude enough for all the offers and gifts of kindness that we have received over the last year. Finally, we must return home and try and pick up the pieces of our lives and day to day with our beloved Grace. Thank you all. To add another devastating layer to this case, the life her dad spoke of was cut short when he was diagnosed with cancer shortly after the trial. David was only 61 years old when he learned of his terminal cancer. He died after a brief battle, surely adding to the loss of his wife and his sons, who had probably only just started to process Grace's unexpected passing. Today, Grace's family and friends have participated in two campaigns to honor her memory. The Love Grace campaign donates handbags filled with essentials for women leaving toxic situations. They got the idea from Grace's love for handbags, honoring her by collecting bags and filling them with useful items for women in need. Grace's family and friends also raised a record amount of over 11,000 pounds for White Ribbon UK, a campaign to end male violence against women. Grace had so many people who loved her, and these campaigns continued to honor her in a way that is specific to who she was. One friend described her as loving her family and friends with her whole being, and it's clear that losing a love like that is a devastating blow to her loved ones, but they're still remembering Grace as the girl with a smile who could light up a room. As for Jesse, the man who Grace's mom said she died terrified and alone with, his name suppression was lifted after he lost an appeal against his murder conviction and sentence. It had since been suppressed because he had faced two separate sexual violation trials, and he was also sentenced for those incidents. In October of 2020, he was found guilty of physical, sexual, emotional, and financial harm against a former partner. She claimed that he held knives to her throat, forced her to perform sex acts, choked her, and drained her bank accounts. He was sentenced to seven and a half years for eight charges. In November of 2020, he was also found guilty of sexually attacking a young tourist that he met on Tinder less than a year before Grace's murder. The 21-year-old girl only came forward after she recognized Jesse from Grace's case. She told the court that he threatened her, telling her that he would kill her and her family if she ever told anyone. He was sentenced to three and a half years for those charges. At the sentencing, Jesse had an outburst at the justice, saying, You're so full of shit. 
You have no reason to convict me. You're full of shit. Which in response, the justice told Jesse that he had no remorse or insight. The lack of remorse is what is truly terrifying about Jesse. He spent a lifetime presenting a facade to the world, but despite all of that practice of lying compulsively to anyone and everyone, the world now sees him for exactly who he is, a liar, a sexual predator, and a murderer. Sadly, it was too late for Grace when she discovered the monster behind the carefully crafted mask. On the eve of her 22nd birthday, just as she had started to embrace her independence, he snuffed out the life of the young woman who wanted to see the world. Instead, he left the world, especially her family, collectively heartbroken over the loss of such a bright light. It's absolutely senseless and absolutely unexplainable and unforgivable. I am curious to know what you think, though, because although many people are divided on this, some do think that perhaps because Grace was into BDSM, this was something that went too far and was accidental. Again, not to shame her at all, this still was at the fault of Jesse's, but some people think that it was something that happened by accident rather than something that was premeditated, while others say, no, because he was holding her throat for five to ten minutes, this certainly was premeditated. He had intentions to kill her. So I'm curious to know what you think. Let me know in the comment section below, and thank you so much for tuning in to another case with me. All right, guys, I will talk with you again very soon, and until the next one, stay safe.